welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TC Jew Folk. This week I talk with Serena Partridge, a singer and songwriter who will be leading in song anyone who attends the Shemitah Project exhibition reception on June 30th at the Minnesota JCC. We talk about harmonies, communal singing, and reclaiming Yiddish on this week's Who the Folk podcast. But before we hear from Serena, this podcast is supported by the Afternoon School in Midrashah at the Talmud Torah of St. Paul, offering online supplementary Jewish education for students in grades 2 to 12. Great Jewish education from any location, now enrolling for the fall. Learn more at ttsp.org slash as-m. Serena Partridge, welcome to the Who the Folk podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. And I'm really happy to talk to you. So you are, we're going to talk about all all kinds of your music and, and all of that, but in the most sort of immediate thing, you are part of the Shemitah Project exhibit uh, at the Minnesota JCC on June 30th. So I think it'd be great just sort of uh, as we get into things to talk a little bit about what that project is and how your community singing project that you're working on is a part of it. Totally. Well, the Shemitah project uh, at the JCC has been an ongoing exhibit with different events throughout this whole Shemitah year. And I'm going to be leading a community sing kind of as they cap off their their big exhibition at the end of the season. So I get to come in and lead songs. Okay. And they'll be they'll be all original songs of mine. And I love writing simple but satisfying songs that get a group of people who maybe have never even talked, let alone sung together, um, singing in harmony quickly. That's the goal. And having a really meaningful experience. So that's that's what I'll be doing there. So this is something that you haven't, like you're not having rehearsals with a group of people ahead of time. This is whoever is there, you're going to give them a sheet of lyrics and away you go? You bet. Um, what I do as a song leader and songwriter is I craft songs that are simple enough that anyone can catch them pretty quick. And then teach them well, I hope, and get a room full of people singing together, whoever shows up. That's awesome. That's awesome. So how long have you been doing this song leading, song writing? And obviously I group those together because you did, because those, those are obviously two very, I'd say totally distinct, but at least different skill sets, right? They're different. So I've been a classroom teacher for pretty much my whole adult life. Um, Not a music teacher, but I love to sing, and I've always used a lot of music in any classroom that I've taught in, um, because I do feel like for any age of human being, it's the quickest way to access trust building and community building that's real. Mm -hmm. So I've always led music in the context of classrooms, but in the last handful of years, as I've started studying a lot of harmony singing music from many parts of the world, and we can talk about that later, um, it's I've been struck by the fact that we we don't have a lot of harmony music for community groups that I think is really exciting to sing, but um, is not so complicated that regular people can't access it is not so simple and cheesy that it's boring and annoying. Um, So I found myself being asked to lead community singing at events like protests and community meetings and uh, family events for other people's families. Um, Like everyone's coming over for Thanksgiving. Will you help us sing together? That kind of thing. And I was looking around like, what are the songs that exist that are really fun for people of all levels to sing. Uh, and I couldn't, I couldn't necessarily find them. So I started to compose them. And um, because I've had a lot of experience teaching and leading in lots of different 
formal and informal kind of settings, I think that that sort of, that's my song leading thing. And then my song writing thing is like, what's, what's the music that people are asking me for? And in the last couple of years, especially kind of coming out of the pandemic, I, not that we're out of it, but whatever, wherever we are, people are really hungry to sing together in harmony Mm -hmm. and to feel connected with one another. And I do think that singing is like turbo speed community connection builder. It's incredible. I think especially in a environment where like, like this one on June 30th, where you're not working with, or they're not meeting each other necessarily for the first time. It's just get up and go. Right. And I think what helps build that, connection also is like we're gathering around a theme. So the theme of that event on June 30th is all about Shemitah, which is a very broad um, theme. But I've been writing a lot of music this year because of Shemitah and also just my own interests in general um, that is about connection to place and what is it what does it mean to let the land rest? And what does it mean to take, take a year of honoring our relationship with place? And I think especially as a Jewish person, I think about that question and I'm in community with a lot of other Jewish people also thinking about those questions and like, how do we live rightly in good relationship to look to the land in a place that is not where our ancestry is rooted. Um, how do we do that? Mm-hmm. How do we how do we reconnect to place when, for for me and my my ancestral lineage, people left Eastern Europe and really don't talk about a connection to place or land. And I think that's kind of a a bridge to understanding where I come from. That's a little bit broken. And for me, I've been trying to spend a lot of time in wild places and write songs that are about connecting to land and to place. And I think I feel called to that from my Jewishness because it's like a, something I'm trying to reroute into. So I was asked to come lead this song circle for the Shemitah project because that's the kind of music that I've been writing and leading for Jewish community groups this year in South Minneapolis, where I live. Um, And so it's like, yeah, it's going to be a random assemblage of people on June 30th, but we're all going to be drawn in by that theme and those Mm -hmm. questions of what, what does, what does living into Shemitah mean for me? And -hmm. that's where the music is going to be coming from. So hopefully that will also help people feel really welcome and like the community is already a little bit formed. Okay. I was going to ask you this later, but since you kind of got into it, I'll jump it, uh, jump it to now. How does your Jewishness kind of manifest itself in your songwriting? Yeah. Well, I think it's a lot around trying to understand where I belong in the world. Um, which, yeah, I suppose we're all on that journey somehow, but I've been thinking a lot about the things that my ancestors gave up or were forced to give up in order to survive. Mm -hmm. And some of that was leaving a place that they had an ancestral connection with, although they maybe hadn't been in a place long enough to have an ancestral connection with it anyways, because people moved around a lot in, in my family's history. Some of that was language, language and music that, you know, maybe two generations ago in my family, they were, were like, we're not speaking Yiddish anymore. We're American now. Um, Mm -hmm. we're going to, we're going to eat salami. Whoa. Just like the great assimilation. Yeah. And I, I know, we know that assimilation is a tool of white supremacy 
So if we want to do work against that, what's the opposite of assimilation? I'm not an expert, but I think language reclamation is part of it. Trying to rebuild a connection to place is part of it, place where I come from. Um, working to be in better solidarity with the movements that I care about in, in this country where my family landed. Um, and, of, and working against racism, which, you know, it's all connected. So as part of this journey that I'm on to reconnect with place and um, sort of the, the cultural heritage that my family members gave up or were forced to give up mm -hmm. in this process of assimilation into whiteness, I, th I think that singing can be a healing modality, like maybe, maybe how therapy can be a healing modality. I, there are, there are lots of ways to heal. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that singing is one of those ways. So I think I'm often creating songs that are helping me reconnect to those things that I feel have been lost. And that's from, from my, my own personal family Jewish story okay. is things, things that were lost that I'm trying to reconnect with through singing and I've found that a, a lot of people in my South Minneapolis, lefty, wacky Jewish community are, are longing for the same kinds of things. And singing seems to be a really great way in. So we'll often, I'll lead singing circles and they move into discussion about a lot of these questions of... Um, how do we reconnect with, with places that our ancestors lived in? Because it feels important to heal some of that brokenness so that we can go forward and be more healed people, doing more healed work in the world. That's really great. I, I, and that's a, it's like a great way to reconnect with your, uh, you know, connect, reconnect with your roots a bit and then sort of combine your Judaism to your songwriting passion. Yeah, I'm into it. <laughs> so one of the, um, one of the things you mentioned earlier also was the, the idea of writing for harmonies. I, I guess, can you explain a little bit about what that is and how, how, if at all, it differs to songwriting more generally? Totally. So I guess for me, singing in harmony is radical and revolutionary. I just, I wish everybody in the world who makes big consequential decisions would start every day singing in harmony because it's this act of listening and producing at the same time. You're not trying, like, it doesn't sound better if one person is doing awesome and everybody else is, like, totally lost. That person who's, like, sounds better or is right doesn't sound right. It's, like, it's only a success if the group succeeds. And uh, success being however you define it. But for me, harmony singing is, like, we're successful when we all feel like we're we're both holding on to our own and a part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. So I do feel that it's a pretty incredible thing that human beings are capable of and like long to do that makes us more human to sing in harmony. Yeah. Um, so when I write music, often I'm writing a very short and simple song with not a ton of words so that you may be, don't even need a piece of paper to learn it. Um, and then it has a harmony part that's like a different melody and a different rhythm, but related words so that everybody has an interesting part. And together you make something really cool and surprising and satisfying to sing, which um, like I grew up singing in choirs all the time mm -hmm. and 
like typical choral harmony in the United States is often like very things all move together. They move in parallel. Um, that's, that's not that exciting to me. I like harmony parts where everybody's kind of got, got a purpose and then together we've created something amazing. It, it's funny as you were speaking, I sort of had these, these thoughts of my, my two daughter's choir concerts for school that I've gone to in the past. And, and the way you're describing it, I'm thinking of that sort of very traditional school choir process. And this is yes. clearly not that at all. And I love that too. It serves a purpose. Absolutely. I, it's, it is interesting. I feel like growing up in academic -y choir world, which I did, mm -hmm. the goal is like you blend in, you are one of the whole, no yep. one sticks out. Um, you like, you kind of soften your edges so that you're all sort of sound the same, which I'm not saying that's a terrible thing. That's a kind of musical beauty, but sure. it's certainly not the only kind. Right. And so I really love to write music that um, has more space for individuality and uh, less polish, I guess. Um, and it's interesting, too, because I also study Yiddish music and sing Yiddish music, perform and teach Yiddish, Yiddish music, which is mostly not harmony music. Um, it's very one voice or one voice with an instrumental kind mm. of the klezmer world. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the reasons that I love singing harmony so much is that growing up and going to shul, I, I was in this reconstructionist synagogue, so there was no rabbi. Everyone took turns singing and most of the people who led the songs had really high voices and I couldn't sing that high. So I think I got better at creating harmonies so that I could sing along because I wanted to sing along. And I do, I remember sometimes getting shushed by people because they're like, we don't like, we don't need harmonies on this. This isn't for harmony. Uh, and I just think that's so funny. Like I've talked to a lot of my teachers of different kinds of Jewish music and, and asked like, is it okay to sing this in harmony? And they're like, Serena, you love to sit around in a kitchen and sing harmony. You think like three generations ago, they weren't doing the same thing. People love to <laughs> sing in harmony. It's what we do. We, we learn a tune. We want to sing along. We make up a harmony because it's really fun. It's just a, a human activity. So that's, that's kind of what I'm going for. So you don't teach like music in school. What do you teach? What's your subject of choice? I've taught in a, a lot of different classrooms. This year, I'm a special ed assistant in an autism program in the Minneapolis oh. public schools. So not, I've never, and I've never taught music in a formal way, Okay, but music is the most effective motivator and connector. So I, I've taught high school science, middle school science. That's like what I went to school to do. And then I've taught elementary school and um, in a school where you like move up the grades with the kids. So I've taught all the grades in elementary school. And then in the last few years, I've been in special ed doing literacy stuff and math stuff. I'm all oh. over the place. I don't even know. <laughs> I, I guess it keeps your job interesting if you get the opportunity to try different areas. Oh, it's it's quite interesting. Let me tell you. It, 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 interesting in the Minnesotan <laughs> sort of way? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, fair enough. Um, Asking a teacher how much they like their job at the very end of the school year is dangerous ground. It's rough. I suppose. We're at the point... Uh, Everything unravels. It's yes. just... Ooh, boy. Yes, we're sort of at the point of the year where it's the, the end is in sight and... We should um, just be on the playground all day. And I uh, try to be. I really do my best. I don't blame you. That seems like way more fun sometimes, right? Oh, yeah. All right. So some of the other things you've been doing in song that aren't related to 
uh, to the Shemitah project. You have, you know, coming up this summer, just looking at your website, and we will have a link to your website uh, in the show notes. You're sort of all over the continent, really. There's a, you know, song workshop in, in Wisconsin, and then a music camp in British Columbia. It's sort of bookending the summer for you. You're kind of literally all over the map. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. I, one of my very favorite kinds of work is leading adult music camps, singing camps. Okay. Um, And the people who tend to sign up for these are usually not uh, like hardcore musicians. They're people who want to have an immersive, meaningful few days or week or whatever it is, um, singing in harmony with some beautiful strangers who they are going to be best friends with. So I do a lot of camps with Village Harmony, which is this national organization that sponsors different programs studying harmony singing music, and Song Roots, which is in Canada. Mm -hmm. That's the one in British Columbia with Folklore Village, that's like a school of folk traditions in Wisconsin. And I just love, I, I often bring a mixture in those kinds of learning spaces of original songs and Yiddish music, which is like my other great passion in life. Yiddish songs, mostly unaccompanied Yiddish songs that I've learned that I've arranged in harmony for ensemble singing. How does Yiddish music land for the for the folks who aren't who aren't familiar with Yiddish, e- either as like sp- Yiddish as a language or just even the concept of what it even is? Because I think for many, it's who have at least heard of it. It's probably considered maybe even a dead language. Yeah, well, that's about to change. <laughs> the way that I share why, like why I'm bringing Yiddish music, Mm -hmm. um, I think is really powerful for people, not because I'm so amazing, but because I, I do believe that as a, as a white person, it's my work to do the deconstructing of white supremacy as it lives in me. And part of that for me has to do with putting in the time and the work to learn the language that my ancestors ancestors gave up in order to assimilate, which is Yiddish. Mm -hmm. Um, And studying Yiddish music for me, because I'm a singer and a songwriter, is like, that's another layer of the language that I can really connect with. So to share with people that... I'm teaching this music because it is my musical lineage and I'm not going to teach a South African song because that doesn't, that's not my right to teach that music. It's not my family's and I don't think it would be right for a white person from Minnesota to like watch a YouTube video, learn a song from South Africa and turn around and teach at a camp. That doesn't feel right, but it does feel more right to me. Um, to have spent some years studying Yiddish language and some years taking Yiddish voice lessons with this amazing teacher. That's another story. Oh, my God. He's the bomb. He lives in Moldova. We meet online. It's the light of my life. Um, But that it feels really important to me to be rooting into my musical ancestral lineage. And that's why I'm bringing these songs. Mm -hmm. And that usually sparks a conversation with a group of like, what, what are your musical ancestral lineages? It, it it opens the door to have this deeper conversation with what everybody's individual stories are. And like, what, what songs did your grandmother sing to you? Mm -hmm. In what language, what language did your, grandparents swear in that's very interesting um you probably learn you could probably learn a lot about somebody based on that answer 
Oh yeah, it's <laughs> the, it's the best. But so even you know at these camps, the majority of people don't speak Yiddish, mm-hmm. don't even have a connection with Yiddish. Um, but everybody has a story about that, about what's what's the language and the music that I'm connected with, or I don't know. And, and maybe through learning Yiddish music, it sparks someone's curiosity to go and talk to their own family about what language, what language the lullabies were in, Mm -hmm. if, if you don't know. And I think that's really important to, to kind of show the journey that I'm on, which has led me to study Yiddish language and music because other people maybe are on that journey too, or want to kind of explore that for themselves. But I think it, it's always interesting to sort of help people if they want to be helped, certainly, but to, to sort of, you, you open yourself up to where you come from and then maybe that opens them up and it sort of helps your musical journey to, to learn where they come from, maybe. Totally. It's all in every direction, mm. all at once. And there is something about Yiddish song that's, like, so emotional and communicative that I have experienced people being like, I don't understand that, but I really understand the feeling I, so I think we it, got I, that. We do. And I think it's sort of in the same way that people, like people who go to the opera don't necessarily understand what they're saying in what they're singing in Italian, but there's the emotion or pick your language, but it, it's the emotion that it's delivered with and sort of everything that goes with it that is communicative. Totally. That's so cool. I mean, I, I've talked to a number of, of people who are either teaching Yiddish or learning Yiddish or singing in Yiddish, and it's so cool to see this sort of resurgence. Yeah. It's, pretty, it's very neat. And the passion of the people who do it is is phenomenal. I mean, it, it's clear that you are so into it and, it, 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 and it's just so meaningful to you that it's really, the the passion definitely carries through. Well, good. Yeah, it's very important to me. Well, good. Yes. That's great. One of the other things, and this is something that's unfortunately, at least on your website, it's not coming up. It happened already, but you said you're going to hopefully be doing it again later in the the fall. You did a, a program on embodying grief through song at the amazing Lakewood Memorial Chapel. And that's something that you hope will be back. Is that right? It's, it's going to be back. I think okay. this will be in early November. We'll do okay. this program again, but this is a collaboration that I do with my brilliant friend whose name is Ann Murphy. She's a life celebrant and death doula in the Twin Cities. Um, maybe you've heard of that, maybe not. But if, if just in case you haven't, um, you might be familiar with the role of a doula who sure. is kind of a supporter to someone as they give birth yep. and go through the process leading up to and afterwards. Um, well... At the end of life is another great big transition, and some people will work with a death doula who has a support role as a person crosses the threshold and passes away, but also a support role for for their family. Mm. So, and Anne likes to say the thing about death and dying is that we're all beginners at it, like... I, no one's ever done it before. And we live in a world in the United States, uh, in the world, at least that I grew up in, that it's pretty taboo to talk about death and dying and even to talk about grief or express emotion around grief. There's a lot of like tightness and holding and fear of death and fear of grief. Um, 
anyway, so she does a lot of incredible work as in, in her role as a death doula and a life celebrant. And she and I connected, uh, around, wouldn't it be amazing to lead workshops together that were about how do you allow grief to come in and how do you use song as kind of the catalyst or way in Mm -hmm. to do that? So we led a few workshops online during the pandemic, but then we had the opportunity to lead something in person uh, this spring at the Lakewood Memorial Chapel, which if you've never been in there, oh my goodness, you got to get there. It's just this incredible building. You've been in there, right? Yes. Just like beautiful mosaic and the acoustics are incredible. It's and it's it's in a cemetery. So like it's a heavy place for a lot of people. But um something that feels really important to me is like learning how to not avoid heavy feelings and learning how to um allow myself to grieve. And I I think song is is a really helpful tool for that because At least for me, when I'm singing, it's like I'm allowing myself to be in my body in a different way. I sort of like the ticker tape of my mind and that constant buzz sort of goes away and I can actually pay attention to the present moment. So we had a really incredible evening there of singing and sharing stories and um, remembering people that people have lost. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll, we're going to do it again in November. So stay tuned. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, and it is such an amazing venue, uh, to be yeah. able to, to be in and for a, a class like that, that's so meaningful, really, uh, really sounds interesting. So people should check out your website and we'll have a link to that as well. Um, well, Serena, thank you so much for joining me. Last couple questions before we let you get out of here. First, what is your favorite Jewish holiday? Ooh, I mean, I really, really love Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Let me tell you why. I was just going to ask you. Well, okay. So living in Minnesota, we really experience the seasons. It's like, it's not subtle. I think about my friends who live in San Francisco or something where it's like, Yeah, it's winter, but, eh, you know, I do feel like, and I appreciate that about Minnesota, the seasonality, because it's like allows me to have my like freaky extrovert summer and then my moody internal winter and then my like joyous prancing about spring. And then the, the fall really is this abundant harvest in Minnesota and everything is so lush and everyone's storing up food and canning food, getting ready for the winter. Things are so abundant. It's beautiful. So I think all of the sweetness of entering into the new year, that has always felt like, yeah, this is when the year ends and begins Mm. for me. So that has always been a really meaningful moment in the year. And I love that that's our calendar. I'm all about it. And in Minnesota, sometimes we get all four seasons in the same day. So it's true. We are, uh, we're on our toes around here. Like today it was hailing. Now it's sunny. Yep. Anything could happen. Keep your head on a swivel out there. It's yeah. uh, it'll, it'll test you. That's for sure. Uh, and finally, what is your favorite Jewish food? Um, I'm going to go with a chocolate babka. Nice. Nice. Any ones in particular? Do you do you make your own? I have made my own and I wish I could say it was better than the Rosenfelds of Newton, Massachusetts. Okay. That's my Top one, actually. Okay. 
It was not as good as Rosenfeld's. We just have to... Oh, actually, this is not true. You know what? The best babka I've ever had was... Um, I was in New York at Russ and Daughters. That's like a oh, sure. deli, blah, oh, blah, yeah. blah, everything. And they had a babka ice cream sandwich. Get this. It was like big round slabs of frozen babka as the cookies, you know, yeah, on yeah. the sandwich. And then like a cinnamon ice cream with like shards of babka in it, in the matrix of it. It was, and of course, you know, it was Russ and Daughters. It was like $15 or something obscene. But $15 seems actually cheap. Well, <laughs> it, was, it was a bunch of years ago. What can I say? Yeah, I suppose. But, so I got this ice cream sandwich. I was like, Bobka ice cream sandwich. I have to get that. And I sat out on the sidewalk and I ate it. And I just made a lot of like really inappropriate, embarrassing noise because it was <laughs> it was too good to be allowed. It was so good. So that's the best Bobka of my life. OK, that so seems far. that seems reasonable that a concoction like that, I guess, kind of makes sense. It uh, was well, absurd. It sounds like it. Uh, Serena Partridge, thank you so much for joining me. We will have the links to everything, including the June 30th Shemitah Project event at the Minnesota JCC. Thank you so much for joining me. This is great. Thanks for having me. Come sing with me. Yay! The Who the Folk Podcast is part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network, a product of Jew Folk Inc. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you have suggestions for other podcast guests, please email them to me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. For our other shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. <laughs>